Hey, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for people in Europe. Um, thank you for joining our monthly um, virtual meetup. Actually, it's been a while. Apologize, it's been a very busy uh, season, uh, given all the visits that we have with customers. Um, Data has been quite active in the market. We've been traveling a lot, talking to a lot of people, uh, evangelizing the technology that we've been working on for the last 10 years and uh, very excited about it. Um, happy early uh, Christmas to everybody. Happy holidays and uh, um, safety and good health for all your families uh, during the holiday season for all those traveling. Um, my name is Howard Lowe. Uh, and um, I'm with Data On, and today we're, we're excited to uh, provide a couple updates on the technology that we've been talking to customers. We also have two guest speakers here uh, uh, to spend their time, uh, valuable time with us. Uh, we have uh, Jean Tori. Jean Tori, actually know Jean Tori for a while. Wow, since 2016 probably. So that's like seven years. Uh, he was our early customer. Now he's an MVP. My goodness, that's you came a long way, Jean Tori. And he's actually based in uh, Norway, right? I got that correct. Uh, we also have Lewis from our, our partner, uh, NVIDIA Networking, the Cumulus team, that will also update us on some of the changes and new technology that NVIDIA is bringing to the networking world. And Jean Tori today will talk about one of the key um, Azure hybrid services that we've been talking to customer about for your business continuity and disaster recovery using Azure Star Recovery. So hopefully um, it'll be a good um, foundational building block for you guys, uh, for people here. Again, like typical virtual meetup, feel free to ask questions anytime you want. Raise your hand and just speak up and we're happy to have a, a conversation. Okay, um, you know, this is the same slide I've been using for the last two and a half, three years since COVID. And, and I think this is, is very relevant because when I talk to customer, I always ask the question, um, everybody has different timeline, everybody has different priorities, and, but the journey that we've been telling customer for the hybrid cloud really depends on wh which part of the journey you're on. You could just start, you could be already in the cloud, or you, you could be in the middle. So, so the concept of the hybrid cloud with Microsoft Azure Stack ESAC really is relevant because it gives the customer a choice on what part of the journey you want to be and, and, and how you're going to take advantage of the infrastructure or technology that, that Microsoft brings to you. And, and these conversations has been very fruitful for all the customers. J just this, a lot of stuff, slides here probably is relevant to many of you, but seems like this is resonating with a lot of new customers as well. Um, which is, believe it or not, it, it, when I visited uh, a lot of state local government agency, not enterprise, I, I would say only 10%, even less than that, 5% of people actually know what is Azure Stack ACI. They have no idea. I'm sure that even if you go to new events on uh, Yoast, a lot of people probably doesn't understand the underlying technology. But, but, but the, the reality is continue to be uh, discussed and continue to be relevant to, uh, to many of our enterprise customers. So a lot of discussion we have with customers is, hey, you, you have a traditional three-tier SAN, um, let's make sure we educate you on the benefit of hyper-converging infrastructure and why Microsoft has that technology. The second topic that comes up quite a bit with our customer base, maybe not you guys, since many of you may not have a dual environment, is the fact that VMware getting acquired by Broadcom and how that impacts uh, their business, and, and a lot of them are concerned, and a lot of people are coming to us and have that conversation. Uh, the third piece, which we actually do a lot, quite a bit, is uh, migration. A, a lot of customers are moving their workload to to our te to the technology of Microsoft, but they always wonder how um, uh, how challenging is it to move production workload uh, while the the system's running, and how, what do we what do they do in terms of downtime? Uh, is a hard to learn. And I think as we speak to customer, there are many, many tools out there and Microsoft's coming out with a native tool as well that makes that process easier for you to migrate from one infrastructure and technology to another, especially Azure Stack ACI. Uh, the, third piece, uh, the fourth piece, which we'll talk about today, but it's, it's quite important. It's actually, I, I think like a top five CIO discussion today is making sure a, a company has a solid 
business continuity disaster recovery story or a plan. Uh, many customers cannot afford just building another data center. However, with Microsoft Azure, you do have that capability and, uh, and you can afford the fact that if you do it right, you can set up a uh, Azure side recovery capability to have DR in Azure. So that's the discussion we'll talk about today. Uh, the last piece of it is you know, how much do I move into on-premise hybrid cloud and what is the privacy latency capabilities? And, and, and these are the topics that seems like it, it recurs many times as I talk to more and more customers. Uh, for many customers, I always have to remind them the transition from a three-tier in infrastructure to ACI. And once you're on ACI, you can now truly take advantage of all the hybrid cloud services and capabilities that Microsoft offers to their customer base. And th that's the benefit of a hybrid cloud, right? Uh, and that's why Microsoft is so powerful because they have a cloud called Azure. Um, the last slide I will use is the fact that uh, there are many, many services that were built in the cloud by Microsoft, but by having an on-premises hybrid cloud infrastructure for Azure Stack ACI, you now could take advantage of these services and capabilities. And, and the, the four is the one that seems like in our market that we talk to enterprise customers comes up quite a bit. Uh, first one is many customers using SQL. How, how do I take advantage of ARC managed data services on SQL and, and make sure the SQL are evergreen, you don't have to uh, spend time managing it and up-to-date security. So data services on Azure Stack ACI with SQL is one quite popular discussion we have. The second one, which we'll talk about ASR, uh, I won't go to do too much detail there. Uh, the fourth one is AKS, uh, containerization, ability to de uh, deploy container, ability to run container, whether or not Azure or Azure Stack ACI on-premises has been an ongoing discussion topic, and you, have, you can run many applications on there, including a lot of AI workload, which we've been talking about before last time on Percep, which is really AI on AKS. The last one is getting quite a bit of attention recently, and, and, uh, and there was an announcement made yesterday, a couple of days ago, there's a blog on the fact that Microsoft did announce about two years ago that Azure Virtual Desktop is going to be supported on Azure Stack ACI on-premises. However, they're still in public, public preview. They will definitely um, release it next year on whatever they decide first half. However, it, it's getting a lot of attention because it is actually a true workload that's very powerful, especially the fact that yesterday Microsoft announced the fact that you could do uh, GPP partitioning on Azure Stack ACI with NVIDIA GPUs, right? All these capability allows the customer to choose the workload they want to run in the cloud or bring on premise, uh, whether or not they can leverage the compute, uh, RAM resources, storage resources, GPU resources on premise without having to continue to spend money in, in the cloud. But underlying the fact that security is still a foundational aspect that all these is built upon, and Microsoft can clearly continue to spend quite a bit of time on security compliance. There's actually a link, believe it or not, on the latest um, Microsoft landing page on AzureStackACI.com, which lists all the compliances that they're trying to get compliance at, whether or not it's uh, in the US CGS compliance, or whether or not other compliance CMCC. So all these are starting to get updated by Microsoft because many, many times auditors, state local government needs those compliance to deploy the solution. So definitely check it out to make sure you see all this compliance capability. Um, without further ado, I, I'd like to introduce John Torrey. John Torrey is going to uh, really spend time, you know, this is lay at night for him, to, to really help us navigate through the concept of um, DR with Azure Side Recovery. Uh, talking about it is very easy. Doing it is not as simple. And I, I hope John Torrey could give you guys perspective. Uh, what are some foundational things you could do to make sure you're ready to use ASR as part of your uh, business continuity disaster recovery plan? Go ahead, John Torrey. Thank you, Howard. I'll uh, share my screen then. You need a mute. So let's see this one. Can you guys see my screen? Perfect. So thank you, Howard. Um, yeah, it's. Um, Azure Site Recovery is an interesting topic, and um, I had a discussion yesterday about it. And um, like you said, it can be very difficult. It can be really easy. It depends on how you how you do it and what you actually do. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, keeping your environment up and running with Azure Site Recovery and business continuity. So like um, Howard said, 
Uh, my name is Jan Tove Pedersen, JT for you English speaking guys. Quite simpler. Uh, I'm a managing consultant at a small company here in Norway called Spearhead. Like like Howard said, I'm an MVP inside the cloud and data center. I blog, I do Twitter, I speak, and I do everything hybrid, basically. A lot, a lot of Azure these days. So Azure Site Recovery was built uh, to, to help or organizations have a disaster recovery solution. And outages uh, can happen uh, any time or any of the, your layers of your inter infrastructure. It can be any kind of um, application. It can be networking and power and all of that. And it's important to keep this, keep your platform up and running in case of an emergency, or uh, you have to plan for moving, let's say a hurricane in Florida, for for instance, you need to be able to, to migrate your workload so that you can continue working or your, or your clients can con continue to work or buy whatever you are selling. And, but outages are not always caused by nature. Um, the, the, the top one is actually hardware failure. We see quite often that hardware in the networking stack sometimes fail. Cyber attack is in the really thing that is growing a lot, uh, getting ha getting attacked with the ransomware or how should I say a damageware where they just start out to damage you. Power failures is another one. Uh, I've experienced that 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 myself where, where a hosting provider did not test their um, their uh, diesel generators and the, the battery ran out and the, the generators did not start. That caused an outage that was quite long. And of course, network uh, is, is a big thing. If somebody messes up BGP it's, uh, and they cannot find it, it can take days to get that, um, that fixed. So having a solution to bring your environment up fast and easy is, is quite um, important. And, you know, unplanned outages costs a lot of money. So the ROI is important to, to calculate um, how much will one hour, how much will one day cost you in production, in sales, in whatever type of business you're actually uh, running. So, uh, and this, these are numbers from Microsoft, what the average downtime cost in the US was for enterprises, which is $100,000 an hour. Uh, for some, that is, you know, a high number. For some, that is, you know, a very low number, depending on what you're actually doing. SMBs, anything from twenty dollars to $40,000 an hour. If you have 100 employees that are not working, that's costing you quite a lot of money per, per, per hour. So business continuity uh, is important to, to plan correctly to minimize your your uh, downtime. And th there are several ways you can, you, you know, plan to do. Disaster recovery is one. Backup is not a, not a, um, it's not a disaster recovery solution. High availability can be if you have a multi-site with um, stretch clustering and, and the site, the other site is independent of the, the primary site. But but it's important to, to look at all of these and see what do we actually need, what is the cost, and what is our our incentives to 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 do this. Um, now, high availability is not disaster recovery. It's as simple as that. If you have a fail a normal cluster, that is not disaster recovery. If you have a stretch cluster, that can be a disaster recovery solution. But if something is shared, if something is causing that uh, environment to fail on one side, it can fail on the other side. Ransomware, for instance, that will most likely take both sides down. So that's that's not a disaster recovery. A disaster recovery is a independent separate site that has nothing to do with your high availability solution at all or your dual site with stretch clustering. It is a it is a standby solution where your important workloads and other solutions are um, are um, replicated too. 
And it can be anything from a full blown environment that is exactly the same as your 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 other data center. It can be expensive and it can be inexpensive depending on how you set it up. With Azure Site Recovery, we can actually do quite a lot of things. We can actually uh, replicate and, and recover from many uh, solutions. We can do from VMware, from Hyper-V, we can do it from uh, Azure, we can do it from Azure VMware, we can do it from Azure Stack, both Azure Stack Hub and Azure Stack HCI and Edge. So we can cover the entire Azure Stack um, environment. It is quite easy to deploy and manage. The, the deployment is not that difficult. And manage it, it's quite easy, but there is quite a lot of things you have to consider when doing, uh, you, we're using Azure Site Recovery. And it's it's um, it can help you reduce infrastructure costs. They can minimize downtime because it is quite fast to to recover. And it's um, it's it's a good solution to use as a uh, recovery service. Now you can actually recover to another data center with Azure Site Recovery. So we can use Azure Site, Site Recovery to recover to on-prem as well, if that's your Forte, but then you know you have to have the exact same hardware running instead of using Azure. So, just wanted to show some key features of Azure Site Recovery. It is quite reliable. It's quite easy to use, and it has a good performance. Uh, it actually uses compression uh, when it's replicating stuff, and the same when it's restoring. It's actually using compression to restore, and then it decompresses at the host. Uh, it's fully um, it's fully updated by Microsoft. So anything, uh, if you have it set up, everything is updated automatically from Microsoft. So the, even the Azure Site Recovery agents are automatically updated. You have a centralized monitoring and alerting and so on. And you can do uh, disaster recovery drills without any impact. And of course, you can do recovery points up to 72 hours back. So if if you have something that was infected 48 hours ago, you can actually restore uh, your solutions back quite a while. Uh, you have uh, multiple data consistencies, like I said. Um, it has a snapshot every five, you can do a snapshot every five hours, five minutes, up to 72 hours, even for app servers. You can do every one hour up to 72 hours for databases. And then you have multi VM consistency as well. So you can do a lot of um, a lot of things. I don't want to um, do too much of Microsoft uh, pr pr promotion here, but it can it can support up to 32 terabytes of data disk support. So it is quite a lot and it has no limits of how many VMs um, you can protect. It supports quite a lot of different operating systems. I think this list with Linux operating systems is even higher now. It supports all the latest versions of uh, RHEL, CentOS, Ubuntu, SUS, OL, and Debian. And it even supports VMware and vSphere and vCenter. And of course, Azure as well. So with that, um, we're almost done with the slides. Um, but I want to show you a little bit of uh, what actually entails with Azure Site Recovery. So it's um, demo time. And with that, I wanted to um, say something. Um, you can set up um, Azure Site Recovery from Windows Admin Center, but at the moment, it is not supported for Azure, for Azure Stack HCI to do it from Windows Admin Center. There is no way to set it up here at the moment. So the way you have to do it, you have to first install the Azure Site Recovery Agent on each uh, node in, with Azure, on Azure Stack HCI. It's a quick, simple um, script to run. It downloads the agent and installs it. Now, once it's installed, 
um, it needs to uh, be registered to the service provider in, in, in Azure, the Azure Site Recovery Provider, which needs to be run directly from the host. And you need a credential for this. Now, let, I'm going to come back to that and tell you how to get this Vault credential. For those that are familiar with the um, the backup, the uh, recovery vault, you know this, but with Azure, um, there are a few things you need to be able to restore. You need a recovery services vault. You need a virtual network to restore to, so the VMs get uh, connected to a virtual network. It can be a non-connected network, but it could be a network in a, in a in a hub spoke design, it can be a, a network that is just connected with a with a VPN gateway down to your production, or whatever. Or let's say if it's um, any kind of so so solution, and it needs a storage account, of course, to uh, store the, the 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 snapshots of the VMs. This is basically all we need to be able to uh, to set up Azure Stack, to set up recovery services. Um, but there is quite a lot of more things to think about, and I'm going to come back to that. Inside this recovery services vault, oh, there is a, a simple overview, and with this um, to to do once you once you installed everything, uh, it's as simple as going into the sorry wrong into the site recovery infrastructure and to the Hyper-V host settings here to add the server. And then you can download the Vault registration key here. So this will download a key that is valid for, a, a, um, I don't remember how many hours, but it's, it, it's valid for a few hours. So you just download it. Once you created a, um, a, a a fabric or a site, basically, you have to create a site, and then you go in here and download the vault key. Once you've downloaded the vault key, you start the process to register it to 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 Azure to the recovery services vault. It takes about five to ten minutes for your host to be registered, but as soon as they are registered. You are then able to start um, start setting up protection for your sites. So inside, so I have you know the machines now connected to this. Once we have done that, we can create a policy. Sorry, I am doing something wrong here right now. Yeah, so I have a replication policy here that we can set up that we can link to our site. And inside this policy, uh, we can create quite a few settings. So my frequency right now is five minutes. I can set it down as low as 30 seconds. It, I can set how many recovery points I have. And with this, uh, the information here can te tells you how many we can set. So it, it accepts between zero and 24. And how many app consistent you can do as well. It's, it's between zero and 12. And you can also tell it, okay, I want to replicate, start replication immediately as soon as you start a protection of a virtual machine or physical machine. And of course, you have some options if you use virtual machine manager as well, but we have not set that up. But the policy is quite uh, simple to set, just create a new one and then. Um, do that, and then once you've set it up, you can associate it to a Hyper-V site. And yes, as you can see, it's already associated to my uh, to my SME Fabric um, site. Once I have the site up and running, and all of this is uh, basically ready, like I said, there's no way to do it from uh, Windows Admin Center right now. I can go into replicated items here. And it's not a backup. It is replicated items because we are just replicating. And as you can see here, I have a one that has a planned failover finished. 
And I've actually done a planned failover of a virtual machine that was running on my cluster. That machine is now in Azure. It is running. And this is a virtual machine that I actually have here, which is now stopped. So when you start the planned failover, it will actually stop the VM. It will replicate the last data. And then it will start the VM in, in Azure for you. Everything is up and running here now. And it's connected to a, a VNet here. And here you can see the, the IP address. If this is connected uh, to something uh, like a domain, if this is a Windows machine that has connected to a domain, it will find the domain and so on, on on the network if that is already configured. Now, if I want to, I can actually change uh, the migration. Now, I've not completed the migration. I can do a commit and then I can change the record, the sync back down again. So if you want to redo, you have to continue this process to switch the replication back to on-prem. And when you're ready to switch over back to your, to your on-prem data center, um, you can do that from here as well. So you can then turn it back. Now, I have this one, which, which has not done a test failover yet. So if you see here, I have a test failover button. And what this will do is it will spin up the VM into my, I recommend a separate network for this, a separate virtual network that is not connected to the rest of your, um, to the production network where all the VMs will be. Because if you have some VMs in there and it's connected to your on-prem to your on-prem network, it will come up there as well because it, it will simulate the VM as is. But this is this is not connected to anything. So I can just click the virtual network, click OK, and then it starts the failover process here. Now to set up a new replication, it is quite simple. And this is a protection group. And I'm going to come back to this. I want to do the source fabric. This is the one I have. You can have multiple. I can choose if it's classic or resource manager. I have no idea why the re classic is still there. You cannot do anything with classic any, anymore. And you can choose what network the virtual machines are going to, which version network and which subnets you put it into. And here you can choose which, vir which virtual machines I want to replicate up to Azure. Now, I know I have a third machine I want to want to do use, but I can choose more than one machine at a time. I click next, and then I can choose, you know, always type is Windows. It finds the, the disk and the, how many disks we have. And then I can choose if I have multiple policies, you can choose that policy. And I can click enable replication. I will start the replication from on-prem. Depending on the size, it can take anything from 20 minutes to several hours or days to finish. Uh, like, like, like I said, uh, it supports up to 32 terabyte disks. So it's, um, it can do quite a, quite a big. Now, the thing here with this, these are policies to, to actually set up. So here you can set tier zero, tier one, tier two, tier three, depending on the level of what virtual machines or what physical machines you want to have started up first, because it's really important to set dependencies correct here. You want the main controllers up before anything else. So that's tier zero. Then tier one can be a, can be a SQL service, data, other database servers, other things that other things then are required on. And, and you do this in you segment this up and down in the correct order to 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 get your um to get your um your replication uh, tiers correct now once everything is correct you can either do manual start of things like i did here where i did the initial test failover here and you can start it manually or 
there are PowerShell commands and Azure CLI commands that you can use and automate this to trigger it uh, with 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 one one go. So you create a script that triggers this automatically for you, or m you trigger the script manually, but it runs everything for you automatically. So you don't have to sit and wait for the restores. It 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 will just do it in sequence. Uh, to do it, which is the best way to uh, to to do it, um, and and that's quite important to to. And when I say you have to do it manually, you there's no way, no good way to have it automatically do because it can be triggered by a false positive. So it has to be always be be manual. And like I said, this can be uh, this can be committed. Are you sure you want to commit the virtual machines? And then you cannot change the recovery point of the virtual machine. So yes, I want to commit. Now, once this is done, um, I can then switch the replication back to on-prem, and then switch the then failover again back to on-prem after that is done. So that is that is um, the basics of Azure Site Recovery. There is quite a lot of more planning, quite a lot of more. Um, things to think about when doing this. So whenever you're doing this, you should test, you should plan, and you should build a disaster, uh, a business continu continu continuity uh, plan for how to how to fail over in case of an emergency, how to how to plan the fail back again. And you have to you have to put some numbers into OK, is is my outage an hour? Then yeah, I don't want to put everything up to Azure because it takes a while to get everything back again. If it's a day or two or whatever, depending on how much it's costing you per, per hour, that is quite important to, to, to think about. And we can set up alerts as well. In case I have a question, JT. Are, yeah. So, um, so I don't speak to everybody here, but I, I you know, talk to a lot of customer about ASR. The stuff that's always in my mind is, is several. Um, will you describe to have the storage ready, the VM ready to replicate into Azure ASR? I get all that. The part that always intrigues me or, or, or kind of is in my head and customer asking me that is, how much work do I need to do to prepare Azure so Azure side recovery is actually ready to be done properly? That's one one question. It comes. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, did I speak no. out of mind? The, the no, second no, no. one that's always in my in the head is um, replicating VM to run. It's real. I can see that it's a Hyper-V replica. However, what happened to all the applications that's been running on premises? And when something bad happened, those applications has to spin up in Azure and run it into the VM. How is all that in the networking piece of it? Those are the three pieces that always kind of get to me and I can't explain properly to customer how those intricacy comes together. So it's uh, <clears throat> sometimes it's quite simple. Sometimes it's quite difficult because Let's say you have an old solution, an old application with an old, let's say you're running 2012 SQL, you're running an mm -hmm. application that is dependent on that, and the IP addresses are hard-coded in the application to reach the SQL server. Well, the IP addresses changes in Azure. Unless you, you set it up with the same subnet ranges that you have on-prem, but then you cannot connect that solution to your on-prem environments because that will that will cause problems because you cannot have the same sub IP addresses in Azure as you have on on-prem unless you use extended networking in, in Azure uh, for with, with with Azure Stack HCI but it's it's not a recommended solution so you have to um, so in the process of building this you also have to inventory all your solutions to make sure that okay find where things are where IP addresses, for instance, are hard coded. Because with DNS, if things are using a fully qualified domain name, uh, the address gets the IP address gets updated in the DNS. So so that's once the VM comes up and it connects to uh, 
to 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 your domain controllers if they are domain joined. L Linux is a different story. You'll probably have to do some manual. So that's in the process of when you're designing this and going through your solutions. Are we? How are we going to spin this up in Azure once something happens and we have to do a failover to 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 Azure? So, and that's the same way we do when you have multi-site. If you're not stretching your VLANs across to a two-site solution and you have to fail over to, uh, to your secondary site, you, you always get new IP addresses there as well. So it's, it's, it's important to think about, think about that. So yeah, the, 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 I know people have had a hard, you know, have um, coming to, uh, to a realization when they're failing or, oh, why is my application not working? Oh, well, some developer hard coded the IP address in the code and not using um, using a uh, FQDN address instead. So yeah, it's um, it's something you have to you know you have to do you have to plan for it. You have to go through your solution and make sure. But it's the same with migrating to Azure. When you're migrating your your uh, entire environment to Azure, you have to do the same thing. Or if you're doing hybrid, it's the same thing. You have to inventory every everything and check dependencies so yeah Thank i'm you. gonna come <laughs> so i'll talk a little bit about uh the things we need in azure uh before the, the things we recommend you do uh before you start doing things in, in in azure and this this also goes back to when you get azure tech hr there's quite a lot of things you should consider doing not only for when you if you're thinking about Azure Site Recovery, but also Azure, because you're connecting your um, Azure Stack HCI to Azure and exposing it if you don't have security properly. So I just wanna just wanna go through the last part here. Um, with Azure, with the Recovery Services Vault, um, it can also be used as a backup vault. So you can actually use it as with Azure with Azure Backup as well. So you can you can do both. Um, Remember, restore times from Azure is takes a long time compared to your on-prem backup, so that's just something you need to 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 consider. And there's quite a lot of things you can do. We can set up alerts. It has Azure has a really good alert solution for setting up alerts for if if your recovery fails. It is quite uh, simple, but it uses uh, it uses logging to do this. So you need to have a log analytics workspace set up. You need to be able to send your um, send your data to uh, your log analytics workspace, and that's done via diagnostic settings here. So you can then create a diagnostic setting and send all logs, all logs, and then send it to a a uh, a log analytics workspace here. And then everything gets stored in the log analytics workspace, and it's uh, and then. To get the logs out, it's a language Microsoft called called Custo, which is really nice. These are set automatic. When we do Azure, we create an Azure policy that actually sets this for you, and it's done by by Azure policy. And I'm going to come back to you a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so it's quite important, and you can also get some if you have Defender for Cloud on. You can actually get a lot of information here as well about recommendations for your um, backup, sorry, your recovery services vault as well. And we can actually see here as well, we have a job pane, so we can tell you how your jobs are doing. If you're um, setting up the, the, the protection, doing the recovery, how it's going, you can actually see what it's actually doing inside here. So you can actually follow the progress of what it actually is doing. So it's quite nice. and. Yeah, you're seeing what it's actually doing. And if I'm not mistaken, we can uh, we can drill down further. And with of course with Arch, with PowerShell and Azure CLI, we can get even more information out. Um, this is just backup alerts, and like I said, you have uh, I can set up email notifications for um, for um, if something is for as for your site recovery events, if there is something that is wrong, and I actually had one uh, a while back 
where something was um, where the nodes were not connected. And this was yeah, 11, 12, two days ago. This was actually when I set it up. It was uh, not connected because I was um, disabling and enabling it again. Um, so yeah, now when it comes to Azure, what you talked, what you asked me about, Howard, um, and we had a, we had a, um, we talked about this in a call a few months ago, where we, where you asked me about what, what do you need to do in Azure. So the question is, are, are you ready to use Azure services? And with Azure services, there's quite a lot of things we need to think about. Microsoft has this, there's this nice word, word this word called governance for everything. Um, and Azure governance is quite, uh, quite important to think about. Microsoft has made something called Cloud Adaption Framework, which is a really, really comprehensive and good detailed uh, documentation of how to build your Azure environment. It is huge. It covers everything from your small business with 10 VMs to and, and enterprises with hundreds of thousands of uh, virtual machines and that does full DevOps and uses the full uh, cuff DevOps solution. But it can be built as small as possible and it can be built as big as possible. But there are some, some basic guidelines that everybody needs. If you are 10 employees or if you're 100,000 employees, there is a lot of things within governance, Azure governance that needs to be done. You need to have identity management. Identity is key in Azure because if you haven't done identity management correctly, or you, you can hand, you can give your, you can give access to anybody in Azure. If you have like a user this and that with passwords at something, it's very simple to, to do this. You need conditional access, you need, MFA, you need privileged identity management where you have to elevate your access in Azure to be able to do things. And we have role-based role access control in Azure that can give you as little permissions as possible. And that's the principle. Least privileges is a really big key in Azure. So it's um so it's really, really, it's really important. And then we have something called landing zones in Azure, which is the building blocks of, of how we structure Azure, your, your subscriptions, resource groups, and so on in Azure. I'm gonna show you a little bit about this. Uh, and and it's, you, can, you can talk a little bit about it as your on-premise domain, where you have um, OUs in a domain, in, act, in Active Directory. We have management groups, that's all use. We have Azure policy, which is group policy just for Azure, but it's much more detailed. You can do so much more. You can limit what kind of resources you can deploy. You can you can say, oh, you're not allowed to do to use public IP addresses. You're not allowed to use RDP from public IP addresses. You're not allowed to use this TLS or SSL version. Uh, we can do auto automated things where you deploy a resource in, in Azure, it 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 onboards other services, other solutions to your to what you're what you've de de deployed. It can audit things, tell you, hey, this is out of compliance. You have to fix this. And there is so much more things you can do. And and with Defender for Endpoint or Defender for Cloud. There's a baseline Azure policy, a security baseline that actually you talked about ISO, about compliance, uh, Howard. There's a built-in compliance check within uh, Defender for Cloud that you can turn on that gives you all the major uh, compliance models and it, can, and it indexes all your services in Azure, including virtual machines on-prem as well, and say, hey, in Europe, we have the, um, uh, the, the ISO 2701, 27001, which is really important um yeah so it, it's actually doing um this is really really so you 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 can do a lot with azure policy and which is really important you need to have a good understanding of your virtual network if you're doing disaster recovery in in, in, in azure it's important to build your network 
correctly and robust so you can handle if it's 10 virtual machines yes it can be simple if you have 100,000 virtual machines it needs to be complex and and built correctly and do a hub spoke design maybe virtual one with fire, azure firewall and so on you need to think about storage accounts key vaults if you don't know what key vaults is it it, it can store certificates it can store keys it can store secrets for your services and there's so much more there are over i think there is like six or seven hundred different services in azure you can use and then you come to the market base which, which are several hundred thousand types of services you can buy from in azure if you want to use palo alto cisco asa whatever solution you can do that but you have to build you have to plan for it and you have to do uh, the basic governance to be able to do this and with Azure governance, there is quite a lot of things you have to think about. And these, this is the, the brief overview of the Microsoft Cloud Adaption Framework governance structure on how you want to do this. You have to think about, for instance, cost management, security baselines, how to build resources correctly because you want to do resource grouping, the hierarchy, the naming. You want to do tags. You can do use tags for almost anything like, for instance, back to, to cost management, you can you, you can tag things so you can get it to the correct department. So it's built to the correct uh, department. We're talking about identity baselining, Azure RBAC, Azure AD, Azure AD PIM, and so on. And then you do about the, the deployment acceleration where we, we do things with policy, like I said, resource grouping, tagging, templating oh my god you can do so much with bicep and arm that you wouldn't imagine we can do devops with pipelines and we or github and then we can do a lot with azure automation but all of this you know it builds to something so it depends on how how small you want it to be or how big you want it to be because it, it's it's a very wide range i can put my hands out like this and it still wouldn't be covering everything that you can do in Azure. And it's really important to secure it because if you put the SQL Server directly on the internet, the 1433 port is not secure. It's quite easy to break into it. So you, if you build, if you have a SQL Server that needs to be publicly available, you need to put it behind a application gateway with a web application firewall in front of it or something like that so that you secure it properly. And, and so it comes down to this, uh, and it's really important to think about this. And even for site recovery, it's important. Even for your Azure Stack HCI, it's important to think about protecting your Azure environment correctly. And with Azure Stack HCI, we get so much things from Azure Policy, from Azure Monitor, from change tracking, from automation, update management, and so on that we can use and we can you, you, you know you can give users access to one vm you can give them access to every vm you can give them access to do whatever they want with the vm basically jt um uh, I, I i i think one thing always comes to my mind is many of the customer we talked to today even people here they're they're the pro and expert at infrastructure on premises and, and they, they're yeah. slowly to to look at this hybrid, but it seems like what you're talking about, there's a lot of knowledge base that's required to be ready for Azure. Um, are, are, you know, are usually the, the, the same people that today sitting here that we're talking to, the, the guys that manage the entire infrastructure for the company, do they always have the right resource or knowledge base to get to what you're talking about? Or, or most of the customer uh, enterprises outsource this to, to like a third party like yourself. How, what do you see? Do people just do it or uh, or it really requires a lot of heavy lifting? It depends on the company size, I think. Okay. Um, the smaller companies, they don't have, they, you know, it's, they're kind of swamped with their normal day-to-day -day work. Yeah. Learning this is quite, it's, it's manageable to learn to run it, to to get the the comprehension of setting it up. Uh, we it's more it's getting it's uh, we're seeing a very uptick in us as a consultancy company helping clients get onboarded to Azure, help them get it up, help them get the right right training, the right competency, 
and building a competency uh, roadmap for how to to actually start using this because because they have so much other stuff to do. Like I said, it can be very, very small. It can be very simple, but you have to learn things. Microsoft has, there's a lot of good resources out there. And I use Google for almost everything I do. <laughs> uh, so it. it's, uh, uh, today I've been troubleshooting a deployment of a function app and it wasn't working and we figured out what it was based on the error code because somebody of course somebody else has had the same problem a month a month ago so it was very simple to figure it out but it it's it comes down to experience about this because you have to do it correct um i would say you should do it correctly from day one if you haven't done it correctly from day one if you've done something in azure it's, it's not a problem because we can set everything up and then you can migrate into the new environment to make sure that everything is within compliance and so on uh within how you want and in within how we have designed it with you as a client because that is one of the key important things that we do as, uh, as a consultancy company is that we talk to the clients and get figure out what kind of level they want to put they they can be on because not everybody can do full DevOps and do the complete cuff environment solution that Microsoft has built, uh, and we can pick out what we need. So, but Thank yeah, you, JT. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, but it's like I said, it depends on time and, and how many IT employees you have. Because if you have four people in the in the department that they are fully swamped, and you need maybe three more people to be able to do this, maybe it's not worth it because it's one person will maybe be the cost of getting this set up and get your people trained. Okay. So yeah. Hey, hey JT, thank you. I didn't want to run out of time. I want to make sure I give a, a plenty of time yep. to uh, Lewis. Thank yeah, you I'm so much. I, I, I'm uh, almost uh, done. Put your, put your information uh, under on, on the thing as well. Uh, I'll let you finish up and make sure that people can reach out to you. Go ahead, finish it yep. up. Yep. So, and like I said, uh, Asher, um, the the governance structure is almost like a, a AD structure with OUs. You have the your Azure AD tenant at the top, you have your resource manager. Then I talked about management groups, then you have your subscription resource groups and Azure resources. And on, on this entire level down from management groups and down, you can set access control, you can set policies and you can set a lot of different things on this. And it's important to get this structure correct. And this is a drawing of, of, of how Microsoft and how we do stuff with, with management groups, how we do our subscriptions and how we build what is called a landing zone for our different types of workloads. And where we also have our platform information where we have, this is a simple one where everything's in one, but where we build our, our main networking structure, then we build our platforms for workloads and so on. Um, and it's quite, you know, it's it's a quite like an OU structure. And it's important. The really important thing with Azure is resource consistency and to be policy driven governance. So you want to have a consistent resources and you want to use Azure policy to make sure you're within compliance of how your Azure solution should be. And of course, identity, there's a lot to talk about, a lot to do. And it's re identity is very important to think about in, in Azure. You need to have conditional access. You need to have multi-factor authentication uh, and so on to, 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 to secure your environment. Like I said, Defender for Cloud, there is a lot of free stuff in here. The baselining, for instance, for compliance is in there. It baselines all your VMs and tells you a lot of things, but you can also turn on the Defender for Cloud for your virtual machines, which is Defender AD, ADP that proactively blocks malicious content. Yeah. And the cost is $15 for the full Defender for Cloud. But like I said, there is a lot of free um, free things within it. So that's basically my um, my presentation. Thank you. If Thank you, you have, JT. If, if there are questions, um, there is a lot more to cover. We can probably talk about this for two days straight.
Just, yeah, so, just uh, uh, give your email back there, and if, if any customer reach out to you, um, they can reach out to you. I trust you so much, so just whatever they need. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll pass it over to Henry now. Henry, if you could do a quick intro for NVIDIA. We have plenty of time. People usually stay till 11.15, 11.30 anyway, so 12.30, so let's go there, um, Henry. Thanks, JT. Thank you. Yep, thanks, JT. So I, I, I basically just want to set up for Lewis as he talks about uh, NVIDIA and Cumulus. And um, one of the first things before we even get there is just that, uh, you know, uh, just to throw out that uh, on our uh, YouTube channel, basically, we did we have uh, videos about the um, software assurance that you can exchange those for uh, Windows data center licenses, Azure Stack HCI, and um, and the uh, what's new in um, from Ignite and also JT as well as uh, Ben Thomas and Ernie uh, had a good chat of, about uh, what was announced uh, at Ignite. So with that, um, there is the Azure Stack uh, blog and a um, couple of things that I just wanted to mention in case you haven't uh, missed it is that uh, they did talk about uh, the GPU and basically the partitioning and the virtual GPU that's part of the NVIDIA. And so that's that's out and also the uh, Windows Admin Center that goes with it. Um, and uh, one of the articles down here is also uh, about network HUD for Azure Stack HCI. And I think this is one of those that we uh, not much as much has been talked about. And the, uh, the, the thing is that it actually adds a lot of value in terms of um, of uh, network visibility, and that's sort of the reason why we're we're discussing the uh, the, the Nvidia and Cumulus. So one of the things that they Microsoft did for Azure Stack HCI 22H2 is to um, come up with uh, some requirements in terms of feature sets that um, they want to see the uh, switch vendors have in in terms of uh, uh, the the software stack. So basically, NVIDIA was one of those that um, uh, put the put those features in there. And um, one of the big things, a lot of them already exist uh, on the switches, but one of the big ones is the 802.1 uh, AB. And basically, the whole thing is the link layer discovery protocol. And having that in uh, the switch OS, and you can see that this is NVIDIA switches, and all, you know, a majority of customers currently are on Onyx, but basically um, with Cumulus, they basically uh, um, added that those features in there. So moving forward, with Azure Stack HCI, we are, we are going to use uh, Cumulus uh, instead. And there is an article in the tech, tech community um, related to the network HUD, and I can't seem to click on it. That's weird. Uh, they basically they have a couple of articles: the introduction to network HUD, and basically HUD being the heads-up display, as if you know you're like a fighter jet and all that. You can see, see things, you know, that type of thing. But basically, is is the idea that you can you can uh, diagnose your environment. And um, what they have done is to say, hey, with network HUD and the switches that have the feature sets. And, and those are the ones like the NVIDIA Cumulus, you can do in version one detection of PCIe over a bandwidth over restriction, uh, unstable adapters, frequently dis disconnecting unstable adapters, uh, using the wrong inbox drivers or uh, missing networking TC in, uh, intent types. And what happens is that if you have some of those type of conditions, then you'll see the, um, this is this is basically your um, Azure Stack HCI health fault, and this, that's what gets displayed in the uh, admin center when you go into the cluster, right? So that's that's the health health uh, information, and basically you can um, get the uh, information there. But that also what it has is incorporating the uh, this feature into Azure as well. So Azure Insights for the cluster. You can have the uh, that information projected into Azure, so that you can now do something uh, with that information. So you can send alerts and whatever else you want to do uh, in the Azure portal. So that's sort of the the whole reason why uh, 
you know, we were, we're moving forward to um, going with a uh, Cumulus and, and all the, the, the features that they have worked with Microsoft to incorporate. And so that, that's, that's my uh, piece here. And, um, and I will turn it over to Lewis, who is going to talk about uh, uh, Cumulus. All right. Thank you, Henry. And I promise I didn't show Henry my um, presentation ahead of time. Let me find the right window to share. Here we go. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, awesome. Okay, just a, a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Lewis Simpson. I'm a senior solutions architect uh, with NVIDIA. Uh, overall with NVIDIA and Cumulus, I've been uh, with the two combined companies for about six years now. I did start out at uh, Cumulus Networks uh, back in 2017, so I've been uh, been there for a while. Um, let me advance my slides. So, yes, Henry just showed this uh, at that link below. So that was the link that Henry was looking at. Um, and it details the switches or the switch series uh, and gives you the links to click on uh, to go to the NVIDIA pages. Uh, for those different series of switches. And what I'll do on the next slide uh, is go down into the details on the switching environment, uh, the switches themselves, and what the different series are and what that means to you. Um, and note that Cumulus Linux version 5.1 or later is required. I'll go into details on that as well. So you'll see the series of the switches on the bottom of the page, uh, SN2000, SN3000, SN4000, and what was not included on the uh, previous page was the SN5000, uh, and I'll get into that a little bit. But right now we have the 2000, the 3000, and the 4000 series uh, certified and ready to go for Azure Stack HCI. Um, these are the switches themselves with the speeds and feeds uh, that each one of them does. Um, the, the SN2000 series is based off the original Spectrum ASIC um, from 16 to 64 ports, uh, 1 to 100 gig. Uh, the two notable ones in the upper left-hand corner are the SN2100 and the 2010. Uh, those are half-width 1U switches. So you can get two of those switches uh, in one U and a network rack. So they make a uh, they make a rack mount uh, for those switches uh, that allows you to have a fully redundant switching top of rack platform in one uh, rack unit at the top of the rack uh, with those speeds and feeds. Um, the SN3000 is based off of the Spectrum 2 ASIC. Uh, 1 to 200 gigs, 16 to 128 ports, uh, the 3420 and the 4410 in that series, and then the Spectrum 3 ASIC uh, from 1 to 400 gig, 32 to 128 ports. Uh, you'll see in green um, any of the switches that have a little nomenclature out to the right in green. These are typically road mapped. Uh, the 22 one on the left is basically your out-of-band management switch. We have uh, released that, and that switch is GA. Um, the 5600 and 5700 are uh, Spectrum 4 ASICs. Those will be uh, on into either uh, before the end of this year or into uh, 23, um, and those will be looking to get certified on the platform as well. Uh, and then the 40, the 4000 series and the 3700 series, you'll see the speeds and feeds 
up there as well. So uh, we will be looking to uh, to add the SN5000 series as that hardware becomes available and we're able to get it into the labs and get them tested and certified. Uh, but those switches uh, in the Spectrum 4 ASICs uh, will all run Cumulus Linux. All the switches on uh, this page uh, run Cumulus Linux and we're currently on version 5.3. Um, so the requirements that were on that web page that Henry was showing you earlier um, are this. So uh, you can go there and get into the details. Um, the only one that we had to do recent work on was the 802.1 AB, and that's what Henry uh, kind of focused on there a minute ago, was the LLDP uh, uh, TLVs and the custom TLVs for the 22H2. Um, version of the networking requirements. Uh, everything else uh, on this page, except for those we had, uh, and that's uh, the, the most recent development that we've done. Um, you can see, if you look at the, uh, the, 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 like the 21 or the uh, 20, early 22 requirements, there was only a couple of, uh, of those custom TLVs. Uh, and then the 22H2, there they added several more to those. So uh, we went and did the development for that. But those are those are their primary requirements. Uh, we've had these in Cumulus Linux for a while, except for the 802.1 AB things. And uh, of course, these are in versions 5.1 and greater. So a little bit about Cumulus Linux for those that, that don't know much about it. Um, you may be running Onyx, uh, which was uh, Mellanox's standards-based operating system uh, that they provided prior to the acquisition. Uh, they did support Cumulus Linux uh, with their ONI platform, and you were able to load Cumulus on Mellanox, which is uh, going back about seven years now. Um, but uh, moving forward with the acquisition, uh, we are leading with Cumulus Linux. Uh, Onyx will probably take more of a sustaining uh, kind of uh, mode within the company, bug fixes and things like that, but uh, no new features from that standpoint. All current feature developments going into uh, NVIDIA Cumulus Linux. So uh, Cumulus Linux is based on Debian 10 Linux. It's a full distribution. Uh, it's just Linux is, is what we like to say. Uh, honestly, it looks like a full-blown version of Debian Linux that's running on top of a switch. Uh, and instead of having NIC cards that appear as interfaces, you have switch ports that appear as interfaces that are fully ASIC-driven, uh, and all of the packet processing uh, in the data plane uh, is done in hardware by the ASICs and packet processors on the hardware. Uh, I mentioned that the current version is 5.3. Uh, we have, if you're using any versions of Cumulus Linux prior to 5.3 uh, in the 5.x line, um, 5.3 has significant improvements in the command line uh, for QoS and for Rocky uh, deployment. For, so for RDMA over converged Ethernet, uh, basically for storage networks, significant improvements uh, in 5.3 from that standpoint. Uh, from a command line, uh, uh, from the InView, the NVIDIA user experience. Um, Cumulus Linux is object model, API, and CLI driven. Uh, so we have a, a CLI that we do call InView. Um, the CLI is a client of the API, uh, and everything uh, flows down into a, an object model, uh, which the object model gives you full configuration for the switch. Uh, in the 5.4 uh, timeframe uh, and 5.5, uh, you'll start seeing the Python API and some open config uh, features that are going to be uh, developed there as well. Uh, because we're just Linux, obviously we work with, we work with Ansible, Puppet, Chef, Salt, uh, everything that you would expect from a Linux-based operating system. If you have an existing tool set that you're using to manage Linux servers, uh, you can uh, utilize that tool set to manage uh, elements of Cumulus Linux. Um, broad support for virtualization, uh, BGP, EVPN, VXLAN, uh, uh, several different models of uh, integrated uh, routing and bridging for VXLAN. Uh, 
Um, and we are in production at Microsoft for the Azure Stack Hub. Uh, one thing to mention in particular, uh, if you want to try Cumulus Linux uh, and you don't uh, you know, want to uh, take up rack space and bring in switches and resources to do it, you can try it in our virtual environment on air.nvidia.com. Uh, it does require a login, uh, but once you have created your login, uh, you have free access to both create your own topologies as well as use topologies and production-ready automation that we have developed. Um, so that's out there if you want to kick the tires. Um, I would say it's probably about 97% of what you're going to see of Cumulus Linux on hardware. Uh, there are some ASIC features that we don't implement in the Air platform, uh, but uh, if you want to kick the tires on Cumulus Linux, that's the best way uh, to do it. Uh, no resources involved other than logging in and using your computer to do it. Uh, a little bit about the architecture of Cumulus Linux. Um, the one thing that we do is we use the Linux kernel uh, for the networking source of truth. Um, so everything flows through the kernel. The kernel is the networking model. Uh, you know, we do everything that we need to do on the bottom to light the lights, spin the fans, manage the resources of the switch, uh, you know, everything that we need to do from that standpoint. Um, the, the control plane is uh, implemented in user space, so things like FRR, uh, IP route uh, 2, uh, different uh, things in user space that, that we use uh, to program the kernel. Uh, and then there is a process called switch D that will program the switch silicon, uh, the ASICs, uh, through, the, uh, through the SDKs uh, that provide the programming. And, and it works the other way as well. If we, will, if we learn things through the front panel ports, uh, that comes in through switch D. Switch D will program the kernel, and that will flow back up through user space uh, in order to be reflected in things like your routing tables, your bridge tables, uh, uh, and everything like that. So uh, just a little bit on the architecture. And again, um, you know, very simple update here with uh, our support for Azure Stack HCI. Uh, there's a lot of resources online that if you'd like to take advantage of them, um, please feel free to do so. And if you have any questions um, or want to contact me, I am Lewis. It's just L-O-U-I-S at NVIDIA.com. So. Thank you guys for allowing me to, to present today. Thank you, Lewis. Really appreciate it. Uh, actually, all the customers here probably has your switches spectrum. I think as they continue to evaluate um, Cumulus, we need to really educate them, and I'm sure you'll be talking to many of these customers moving forward. Uh, guys, uh, happy holidays. So I went over a little bit, but I want to say happy holiday to everybody. Um, have a safe safe travel if you guys go away um, enjoy the holidays and uh, i look forward to meeting all of you and see all of you come next year thank you for attending have a great day